We've gotten used to the fact that in our pockets, handbags, or hands, we constantly have ready access to all conceivable kinds of information. In a matter of seconds, we can be updated on the latest news, find out where our friends are, or find out whether the restaurant we want to go to has vacant tables. But in the years to come, artificial intelligence will be even closer than that. It will be living in our possessions, in our bodies, and helping us think. It senses how we feel and sees to it that our refrigerator, the weather report, and our outerwear are all working together for tomorrow. With our cognitive partner, perhaps in the form of a hologram, we can have a dialogue when we need to make major decisions. It will be a whole new world. But in the center of all of this, among the future technologies and robots, will be us, humans, still standing. What role will we play in this future? And what will the road to there look like in terms of ethics and morals? Today, we are in what is known as second-generation AI research. The first generation in the 80s and 90s focused on computer science and logic. Today's AI focuses on machine learning, meaning that AI systems learn from large amounts of data with the help of such things as neural networks and deep learning. But at the same time, we are knocking at the door of a third generation, which concerns how we humans also become part of the AI system. And this is why the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation is now investing almost 5 billion Swedish crowns for support in AI research in Sweden. That's nearly 600 million US dollars. So that the technology that will change our world can take shape right here. When we talk to Google Home or Siri today, we can get help in calculating numbers or find out what the week's weather is going to be like. But soon, you'll also be able to ask questions such as, where are my sunglasses? And the personal assistant will in turn be able to communicate with all other sensors in the home and actually give you an answer as to where exactly your specific sunglasses are and not someone else's lost pair but also understand that those glasses that it sees are exactly your glasses that you've been wearing for some time. So this ability to combine sensor information also with um, services, I think, will open up a lot of per, uh, possibilities. Amy Lotfi wants to teach robots to see and understand the world as we humans do, but the road there is full of difficult trials. So the reason why this is challenging is because when we use sensors, whether they be distributed in the environment or even on a robot, those sensors often give us information that is just numerical. You can think, for example, if you look at a picture, it's just a bunch of pixels. And the challenge here is how do you augment that information? So if you imagine you're looking at a picture of an apple, how do you go from these pixels to also understanding all of these interesting properties that apples have, that it can be held in your hand, or the sound that it makes when you bite into the apple, the uh, sourness of the taste of the apple and what you can do with it. And that's really the challenge that I'm trying to look at by taking all of this sensor information and putting it together and learning how to represent that information for an artificial system. Amy's lab is a training camp for robots and a seemingly simple game like hiding a ball under a cup and then answering where the ball is, is for a robot still too complicated there is still a lot it has to learn. So one of the ways uh, artificial systems can learn about it is first of all, to create not just a category, not to know that this is a cup, but also to know that this is a very specific cup. 
it's this exact cup. And I have three different cups and to keep track of each cup as each cup moves. The other thing that it has to start to learn is the fact that just because you've seen, for example, a ball, which is here, um, that objects don't magically disappear. And that if you no longer see it, most likely one of the objects that's blocking it can contain it. And this is what's called reasoning. So it's no longer only about learning from observations, but also reasoning about the observations. And that's really sort of the fundamentals of AI. Hey, Pepper. How you doing? Hello, human. I'm super good. Thanks. And you? How are you? This is Pepper. And as a final step in going from perception with sensors to creating meaning from what the sensors and cameras measure, Pepper will now be tested on interactions with humans. So I'm thinking an important part of the interaction is both eye contact, but then also to gesture where the ball is. So I think we should run an experiment now where we show uh, the, the ball and we put it under the cups and then we let Pepper see where the ball is. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Okay, Pepper, where's the ball? Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> this time, Pepper failed at finding the ball, and Amy's work will continue to enable robots to work among us humans. I think in 30 years, what I envision is that we will have a lot of machines that are autonomous. That means moving around us, making decisions, changing the world around us. And I think a very important part of that is to give machines the ability to perceive and sense their environment and to understand their environment in a way that is also coherent with how we understand the environment. So we work together. In Lund, two researchers with completely different backgrounds are at work. Inger Brink, a philosopher, and Christian Balkanius, a robot builder. Om 30 år kommer det finnas robotar överallt och förmodligen långt innan dess. Man kan se munnen plötsligt. Ja, jag ser det men vad snyggt med färgen. Men ibland kan man ju tycka att orange är lite aggressivt, men jag tycker att här ser det mest vänligt ut. Jag är inbjudande faktiskt. Så spännande. Inger and Christian want to make it possible for man and robots to live side by side in an open and equal way. Och man kan ta ett exempel om man möter dem på en trottoar så tittar man på varandra lite snabbt och visar att man sett den andra och markerar att man kommer inte gå in i den andra personen. Och den typen av så små signaler är sånt som vi är intresserade av att studera här i i robotlabbet och försöka överföra till till robotar. In the past robots have been used as a tool. But when they take the step to becoming equal participants, we will end up with a completely new reality which will require new solutions. Här har vi alternativt att robot huvud. Vi hittade på internet och köpte det som exempel på hur ett robot huvud inte ska se ut. Och det finns en sån här rolig effekt att ju mer realistisk saker blir, ju mer det ser ut som en riktigt öga till exempel, desto läskigare blir det. Så helst vill man vara en robot som ser ut som en robot och inte som, som den här då. So traditionally, the design of human-robot interaction has focused on trying to uh, mimic human cognition uh, and reproduce uh, the cognitive capacities of humans. The way we see it, things should be turned upside down, so to speak. And instead of starting with what's inside the head, we should start with the social context that robot and uh, human share. What we need to get this going, of course, is not only a robot that is capable of asking for help, but also a human being that 
wants to offer help. And so we get the real interaction. So in their joint research with Christian's robot, they perform experiments, for example, examining how two different arm movements from the robot can be perceived differently by a subject. One movement that the researchers call efficient movement is simply straight and fast. The second movement mimics a social and inviting gesture where the robot raises its hand high to show that it wants to cooperate. Och det som händer nu är att uh, roboten kommer att flytta en kloss och sen är det en uppgift att ta den här klossen där och sätta ovanpå den andra klossen som roboten har flyttat. Okay. Uh, och det är hela experimentet så nu kör vi igång det. Men upplevde att det blev någon interaktion med roboten? Uh, ja, men på ett sätt tyckte jag att det fanns en interaktion uh, med att den, just att den sträcker sig mot mig uh, när den sätter ner uh, och att jag sen ska lyfta min kloss och sätta på den. Mm. And so this is what we would like to reproduce in the in our robot. So if the robot uh, is using these social movements, so to speak, and we can uh, uh, make it do that in, in a way that prompts users to respond in the same way and also start to socially interact with the robot, well, then we're home. Then we have uh, established cooperation between the two without uh, relying on uh, emotional engagement and so on. AI's brain is like a black box with a digital consciousness. And this black box needs somewhere to train. At the Visualization Center in Norrköping, Anders Innerman and his colleagues work to build entire virtual worlds where AI can practice. The way we are working with machine learning and artificial intelligence here is actually in two different ways. One way is to try to make machine learning better. And the other way is by trying to understand how the black box of machine learning, how it actually works using visualization. Of course, it's possible to film real environments and try to get AI to train with the images. But the training environment is much better if the researchers themselves build these training worlds. This can lead to utveckling of very powerful tools for algorithm design, utvärdering of AI and machine learning algorithms, and even an increased understanding of how they work. Under the leadership of Professor Yunus Unger, Nor shipping is therefore working to build up the exact environments that the scientists want AI to be able to train in. These are indoor environments as well as entire cities. And here, the researchers can, with precision, influence the weather, reflections on cars, which buildings should be present, and any animals that they want to appear. In this way, an optimal training environment is created. Och då kan vi automatiskt generera bilder som ser ut till exempel så här. Så, så vitsen här är ju att vi kan både ge det som sensorn ser som ett resultat av en scanning utav, som den skulle göra i en verklig miljö. Men här har vi facit också så vi vet vilka bilar, vilka fotgängare det är som har skapat just den responsen. Och det är precis det som vi behöver i maskininlärning att vi har både sensorns data och så har vi facit som vi kan använda för att träna systemet. But how does AI actually do this? To learn to drive in these environments. The AI trains itself. AI has something called neural networks and in them AI mimics our human way of learning. AI trains, makes mistakes, and tries again. I think this is a new paradigm in, uh, in computing and in understanding of 
our world that we live in. And I think it's very, very important that we humans put ourselves in the context of AI and machine learning. But before the self-driving cars can roll on our streets, they must also be capable of learning ethics and morals. A self-driving car may need to make an ethical decision. Should the car, for example, give way to a dog that runs across the road and thus risk the passenger in the car? There are no clear answers to these kinds of questions yet. But further north in Sweden, we are working with which morals and ethics AI must have in order to be able to make the best choice in the human world. AI will shape the future and fundamentally change our lives. And therefore, we should proceed slowly. So, says Virginia Dingnam, a world-renowned researcher in AI and <laughs> ethics. Ethical principles in AI are actually about us, about the people who develop and use AI. Virginia is researching methods that will ensure that AI and autonomous systems are shaped in a way that does not conflict with our human values and ethical principles. Of course, AI can do a lot of great things, and we already see a lot of uh, very good applications of AI, but we really have to be uh, looking as well at the impact of this systems and also how do, how do we want these systems to uh, work in a way that benefits everybody. And then you see uh, all the transportation now and who is infected and is still moving around and is not uh, isolating in the house. So the ones who are not fo following the rules like they should yep. be following. So this, yep. Yep. And here you see it as well in the graphs. Here, for example, we see in Frank Dignam's research, AI helping to simulate how the coronavirus spreads among the inhabitants of a society. But when it comes to decisions that are crucial to our lives, which ones do we really want to hand over? And how do we make sure that the choices AI systems make go hand in hand with what we humans actually want? So if you are building, for instance, medical uh, robots which can help someone take the best diet possible and take the medicine on time, we are, and because that's good for you, but you don't really accept it as the, the user, how can we align these two things? So it's really not just what is good for you, but also what you yourself want. And we really have to be able to combine these two uh, aspects. But programming ethics and morals that all people think is right will be difficult. Because even we humans don't all agree on what is right and wrong in all situations. How then should we be able to teach the robots? And even today, AI has affected real life in a discriminatory way. A very recent case is in the United Kingdom uh, because of the corona uh, crisis. High school students were not able to do some of the exams which they should have done for uh, admission to the universities. Instead, an algorithm was used that would calculate the grade each student would have received if the student could have taken the test. The algorithm based its prediction on previous grades and how reputable the student's school was. It turned out that the students who had good grades but went to a lesser school were discriminated against. This type of issues, they do make uh, impact in people's life. And that's why it's, it's not about the AI itself, it's not about the technology, but it's really being aware that what are we doing with this technology? So we really need to be very, very aware as researchers and as developers of AI that our uh, systems really make an impact. And if we, we have to make sure that this impact is the impact that we really want it to be. Exactly what our future will look like 
and how long it will take before we live with robots among us is thus far difficult to predict. And the challenges, they'll continue to grow. But here in Sweden, there are still researchers working to make sure it is as good as possible. Our future with humans and AI side by side.